Beautiful and effortless. Ballet is one of the world's most elegant art forms. The human body as poetry in motion. Achieving and maintaining the artful illusion of ballet is all important, but it's just that, an illusion. A lot of times people will watch someone dancing and say, well, I could do that. I could jump and turn. And it's very hard work. You want an audience to enjoy what they're seeing. You don't want them to see the work in it. You want them to see the beauty. So every time you go out on stage, it's your challenge to make the audience think that what you're doing is not work, that it's easy, which of course it's not. <laughs> What separates ballet from a sport is the fact that you have to do all these things under pressure, yet look completely elegant and, and suave. What kind of commitment does it take for dancers to master the unmistakable yet rigorous style of ballet? And where does that commitment lead young dancers in their pursuit of excellence? The School of American Ballet in New York City teaches the art of ballet to about 300 boys and girls from the ages of 8 to 18. The school is one of the most prestigious ballet academies in the world and produces professionals on a regular basis. Students begin studying at a young age for the simple reason that they have to. It takes 10 solid years of training to make a ballet dancer. And when they go professional, most will do so at around age 18. So those who are serious about dance typically need to be serious by age 8. Caitlin Gilliland has been serious about ballet for a long time. She has been attending classes at SAB, the School of American Ballet, for three years. Caitlin comes from a ballet family. Her mother danced with American Ballet Theater. Her sister is also studying to be a ballerina and her grandmother founded the Minnesota Dance Theater. I started ballet when I was about three years old in my little leotard and matching skirt. And I had no idea what I was doing, but I think then when my parents saw that I really enjoyed it, that's when they decided to put me into classes. David Protus is a newcomer to SAB and has been attending classes here for only a few weeks. Even though he's a new student, David has been chosen to be a part of the advanced boys class. He won't be ready to launch his career for at least another year. Here's David. I started dancing just around the house. Usually my productions included some sort of prop, whether that was like a stick or like a shawl or something at Boston Ballet School. I was the only boy in the classes, so it took some getting used to, I think. But I think the, the fact that I was passionate about it and that I loved it sort of, uh, you know, canceled out the fact that it was at first a bit daunting to be in a big room with a bunch of girls. I thought that coming here would give me an edge to my dancing. Also, just being in New York City, there's a vibe at this school where things are really happening, and I think it's both the school and the city that feels alive. 
Giovanni Villalobos is another advanced student. Assemblé. Ah. He is nearing the end of his formal training before hopefully landing a career in professional dance. I don't come from a wealthy background. I couldn't have possibly come here on my own. The school helped me come here and study. Giovanni said to me once, I'm a little poor kid from Puerto Rico. We have no money, we have nothing. And I just want to dance in the New York City Ballet. This is my passion. He has, he has passion and he has desire. I started out when I was eight, taking class every Saturday. By the time I was like nine and a half, I was taking class every day. And now it's progressed to the point where I have to take class every day from Tuesday to Sunday, and I have to rehearse for four or five hours every day. So, you know, it just, <laughs> it just gets harder and harder. These students are part of a modern breed of young dancers, highly trained and devoted to their craft. They are learning classical ballet technique, but their technique has advanced far beyond the point when ballet first started, more than 300 years ago. Ballet began as a form of entertainment for Italian and French royalty, when members of the court would put on a show for their kings and queens. They looked very, very different from the ballets we see on stage today. That's to say there was singing, there was dancing, there could be poetry declamation. Frequently there were exotic characters, the Sultan of Turkey coming in on a camel, not that there were camels in Turkey, but he came in on his camel. Ballet performances were organized around events, such as the king's birthday or a visit by a wealthy nobleman. These royal palaces were filled with people so that the banquet areas where the earliest performances took place would be thronged. Therefore, they were, in a sense, almost performing in the round. By the mid-1600s, the proscenium stage was introduced in France, separating the spectators from the performers. At that time, ballet was a musical interlude to opera's singing and drama. But ballet began to draw its own crowds, and it soon went professional. Popular stars began to emerge from the ranks of the corps de ballet. Then, in about 1820, one Italian dancer transformed ballet to the way in which we experience it today. Marie Taglioni began dancing on the tips of her toes. She was able to go up on point, to linger on point, even on one foot, and to maintain an aesthetic image. And in her case, it was this girlish, almost virginal, chaste image, wearing white or pastel colors. And when she rose on point, it really did seem to people in the audience that she had entered an enchanted land. Dancing on point is essential to the ballerina. It differentiates modern ballet from modern dance, which is often danced barefoot. Even before ballerinas started to dance on point, the French had established five positions of ballet by the end of the 17th century. The five positions mark the beginning and end points for all movement in ballet. Plie one. These five positions are still considered the cornerstone of ballet, and they provide a universal foundation for ballet technique around the world. All right, we'll do it again. And plie one. Bend your neck. Don't look down. And bend. Bend and up straight. And hold. K-1 
Kay Mazo looks for the correct form of each pose or movement. Again, to the bar. One. All the way down to supporting leg. Bend and tendu side. She danced with the New York City Ballet for nearly 20 years and now teaches at SAB. Again. Please. Caitlin is extremely long and powerful. And when she stretches from her arm here and the leg and back to arabesque, it seems it's, you know, almost a football field. But the mastery of technique alone is not what makes a dancer good or great. You can have dancers who are very good in the classroom and um, learn to do all of that, but then you have to have something else. And Caitlin does have that. That something else can't be taught by any school, yet it drives everything. I don't think you can become a dancer if you don't have a passion. You have to put in everything you got in the f most formative young years. And so you have to sacrifice. And when you learn that from a young age, you better have passion. You better love what you're giving everything up for. When Caitlin suffered an injury and had to sit out her daily regimen of exercise and practice, she realized how committed she was to dance. If my injury did anything for me, it showed me that it's not so much that I want to dance, but that I have to dance because there's really nothing else that I would want to do. There's not another option for me. The School of American Ballet has been nurturing passionate dancers since it was co-founded by choreographer George Balanchine. In 1925, at the age of 21, Balanchine immigrated to Western Europe from Russia. He began to choreograph for Sergei Diaghilev's Ballet Russe, the most revolutionary ballet company of its time. Balanchine's cutting-edge choreography wowed audiences and catapulted him to ballet fame. But his collaboration with the Ballet Russe came to a sudden end when Diaghilev died in 1929, leaving his company without a future. Meanwhile, in America, a young entrepreneur named Lincoln Kirstein was determined to start an American ballet company that could rival those in Europe. In 1933, Kirstein traveled to London to meet George Balanchine to convince him to come to America. Balanchine didn't know whether to trust him or not to trust him. He was he crazy? Was he not crazy? But he thought, why not go to America? There wasn't, didn't seem to be too much to hold him in Europe. And so, a few months later, he got on a boat, and in October 1933, he steamed into New York Harbor. Kirstein asked him to form a ballet company, but Balanchine knew that it took time to develop the talent of a ballet dancer. And Balanchine said to Lincoln, but first I need a school because I need to grow my dancers. I need to find them and teach them and train them, and then I can have a company. The dancer's career is short. People don't dance for 50 years. So you constantly have to have new dancers, and Balanchine wanted them trained in certain ways. In the bustling environment of New York, Balanchine pursued a different kind of ballet style. Key for Balanchine was the way in which music was closely linked to movement. But his dancers' movements didn't simply follow the music, they were driven by it. And like his surroundings in New York, that movement was fast. Balanchine, he opened a new highway to how to dance brisk, fast, clean. They had so much passion and soul in those ballets, plus they were moving so quickly, and that's what was so fascinating. Also important to Balanchine's choreography were his new forms of partnering. Those ballet duets that he wrote, the pas de deux, 
were as inventive as anything anyone had done in dance up to Balanchine's time and are still being performed to this day. The originality of the partnering is almost unbelievable. Balanchine was really the person who advanced it and explored it. Where did it all come from? It just came. In 1948, 15 years after they founded their school, Balanchine and Lincoln Kirstein opened a professional ballet company. They called it the New York City Ballet. It quickly became one of the world's premier ballet companies. Today's New York City Ballet retains a distinctive profile because its foundation, if you will, is this repertory of Balanchine Ballets. No company dances as many Balanchine Ballets as the New York City Ballet does. You can come into fifth, all right? That's right, that's right. All right, left side girls, ready, seven. Ballet is unique in that it is handed down, one correction at a time, from teacher to student. Point, point. Kay Mazo's teacher was the legend himself, Mr. B. Yes, yes, that was the boss. He wanted to dance his ballets, his extraordinary choreography. I knew him when I was nine years old. We had something called a special class, and there were about 10 or 11 of us girls in that. And if you got into that class, you almost knew you were on your way. You worked with him every day. He was a genius, and I had that extraordinary time with him. Peter Martins also started dancing young in Denmark. My sisters were auditioning at the Royal Danish Ballet, and they brought me along, and I sat and waited you know, in the hallways, like eight hours. And somebody saw me and uh, asked me to point my foot. And I said, well, I'm not auditioning. And they said, well, no, but you're a boy. <laughs> so I pointed my foot, and they took me, and they didn't take my sisters. And I was seven or eight, and I really didn't like it much for the first five years. And then I met the teacher at the Royal Danish Ballet, who changed everything. And he made the ballet important, enticing. And that's when I, all of a sudden, began to love ballet. Peter Martins and Kay Mazo dedicated their careers to the New York City Ballet. In the 15 years that they danced together, Balanchine created some of his most innovative partnering roles for them. Violin Concerto was choreographed in honor of longtime collaborator and composer Igor Stravinsky, following his death in 1971. There were some very difficult partnering movements there, and there was one in particular where I had to balance and Peter turned me, I had to put my leg on his shoulder and turn around and usually Mr. B would change things, but he said, no, I think this is what I want. At the very end of the pas de deux, there's a bow, Peter's hand over my shoulder, my foot doing the same thing, and then we bowed all the way to the ground. And the hand comes up and Peter puts his hand up in front of my eyes. And there were many things that, that Balanchine said about that, but at one point he said, now we, we're bowing to Stravinsky. And then he's gone. Up. Take. Three. Up. Four. Switch arms. Go. And down. Promenade. Because of Balanchine's interest in modern partnering, that class is one of the most important classes taught to advanced students. Boys have the same class as the girls do up until a certain age. They come together when they get older to learn pas de deux, which is partnering class. And 
that's when I think the boys finally realize that the girls have been working as hard as they have. Front, side, turn, side, turn, arabesque. Jock Soto teaches the class. Look, you don't grab this, you grab this. He was also a student at SAB before joining the New York City Ballet when he was 16, eventually becoming one of the most respected dance partners in the company. Balanchine said that the woman is everything, the ballerina is everything. So what is she in partnering? It's about her. One, gently down. She shouldn't be resting on your chest, boys. Take her nicely. I told my students the other day, I said, you have to think of her as a porcelain bowl, something, and you put it down very lightly, and then you let it go. And one, go get going, boys. Gently, softly, and promenade. The boy should look like he's invisible. Now she's in spin. That's my vision about partnering. And that's the way I tried to partner when I was in the company. And I think that that's how to take partnering into the future. The complexity of modern partnering requires years of practice to master. It's one of the most physically demanding skills of ballet. Yet it's also one of those times when it's especially important to look at ease. Careful, boys, back. I think the most important thing you need to have in your partner is trust. You just have to build a trust in the studio that will be there on stage so that you know you're there for each other. You just have to be really comfortable with each other. When partnering is going well, it's probably one of the highlights of being a dancer. When you hit that flow and when things work, I find it's just an incredible feeling and I, and I love it. Up and down, she's late. When One. it's not going so well, you know, it's a challenge. One, two. Put her down nicely, please. One, fill out all of this music, girl. People don't realize that in order for the girl to look, you know, flawless, you have to position your hands at the right spot, the right time. If you do it too soon, we can see it from a mile away. If you do it too late, you won't be able to lift her. We're all accustomed to working with our own body, but it's a whole different story when you have to partner a girl, because you have to worry about your weight and hers. So it's, it's hard. I've seen a dancer go from, you know, this high to this high, and then all of a sudden he's 6'2", and then he's skinny, 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 right? So they do push-ups. I tell them that they have to bulk up a little bit because they can't just work on their legs. First of all, you have to look like a man. You can't just look like this skinny thing on stage. Let's have six couples, please. When she turns, you grab this wrist like this. Look at my hand. You don't do this. You do this with your wrist. She goes down. One thing I really like about his partnering class is it's not just about, okay, lift the girl, do a pirouette. We do a lot of intricate, you know, hand placement and body weight transfer. And it's actually the more subtle partnering. I find that's the most difficult, but it's the subtlety of it that can make it look so beautiful. I think it's always been my favorite class of the week because it's kind of like a gateway into how it really feels to be dancing with a partner and dancing in a company and then going on stage. And you can do this. Get up, go behind her, step forward and bow and go. One go, fast, Isabel. Four. Students rehearse for the year-end workshop, where the names of those invited into the New York City Ballet will be announced. It's a very exciting time for our students. They, um, they all want to perform and participate, and they do. Now really hit each other, get her bottom, good, and next. And it gives Peter Martins a chance to also see the students performing on stage, which is different than when they're in the classroom. And one, good. 
Shoulders down long. As ballet master in chief of the New York City Ballet, Peter Martin selects fewer than 10 of the 50 advanced students from the school to become apprentice members of the company. There's a lot of variables. First of all, how many dancers, bodies, can I absorb at the New York City Ballet in any given year? Last year, I think we took seven or eight. Sometimes we take four. Keep going, better. Both Caitlin and Giovanni are dancing featured roles in two of Balanchine's best-known ballets, Union Jack and Serenade. It's just a beautiful part, and Balanchine, you know, he choreographed it on students, and so I think when he made it, he was very mindful of the stage that students are at, because it was for students to kind of mature into ballerinas. To be considered to have the ability, I mean, for the teachers to say, yes, he can do this, was, a, was an honor to me. What? The role is amazing because it's a happy role. It's one of, those, one of those roles where you can really get carried away. You don't have to bottle everything and, and, and be elegant. You can actually, you know, have a smirk in your face and have some fun. After years of dedication and months of rehearsal, the students are finally ready to go on stage. But just before the performances begin, Peter Martins gathers selected students for a surprise presentation. I saw Peter coming up to the front, and I was like, oh, Lord, is this what I think it is? <laughs> yeah, and yeah, right, right there and then, we were about to start the show, he said, we would like to invite you to become apprentices with the New York City Ballet. Giovanni and Caitlin have both landed a rare opportunity to dance with the New York City Ballet. I remember just looking at the floor in disbelief. It's like, this is the moment I've been waiting for for so long. It was June 7th, and that happened to be my 17th birthday. And that's definitely the best birthday that I've ever had. <laughs> Imagine, you know, you have all this euphoria, all this, like, joy, and now you have to control yourself and be cool, cool and collected <laughs> and go out there and perform. could remember was just that I danced. I just remember starting and finishing and just the amazing feeling of knowing that I had made it. It's one of those nights that's kind of surreal, I think. And dancing after that was, it was probably the best performance of my life because I was so happy. And I think I cried a little too. I remember the curtain going up and my first entrance and then my last entrance. But all throughout, it's just a piece that really kind of transforms you, I think. And I felt like I was becoming a ballerina when I put the costume on and when I did that ballet. That was like the first time that I really felt like I was on my way.
Lincoln Kirstein and George Balanchine created the first major ballet school and the most important ballet company in America. Together, these institutions advanced the art of ballet and continue to revolutionize it with every new performance and with every new innovation in technique. The legacy of Kirstein and Balanchine lives on in the dancers whose lives have been transformed by a lifelong commitment to ballet. You just have to go for what you want because tomorrow it might not be there, you know? And if it's not, that's okay, but today I have dance and that's what I love to do, so I'm gonna do it with all my heart. <laughs>